guys, and welcome to episode 203 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now in this episode, I interview clinical psychologist Dr. Sally Winston. Now, you may have read her book, Overcoming Unwanted Intrusive Thoughts, which she co-wrote with Dr. Marty Seif. And uh, I got on the podcast to talk about her new book, which she also co-wrote with Marty, called Needing to Know for Sure, a CBT-based guide to overcoming compulsive checking and reassurance seeking. Now, reassurance seeking and and checking are are common compulsions, obviously, within OCD. So it was great to dedicate a whole episode to these compulsions. Uh, And in it, I asked, obviously, about her story, what got her into uh, treating OCD and in writing these books. We talk about why is reassurance seeking a trap, um, changing relationship with uncertainty, reducing these compulsions, what it means to live in a world of maybe and good enough, which is a phrase Sally and Marty use in their book, how families can support people wanting to break OCD reassurance-seeking cycles, sticking points to getting past these compulsions. I really enjoyed this episode. I personally learned a lot from it. Um, I hope you will too. Uh, Yeah, so without further ado, here is Dr. Sally Winston. On the podcast today, I have Dr. Sally Winston. Sally co-founded the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland in 1992. She is the co-author of Overcoming Unwanted Intrusive Thoughts and co-author of the new book, Needing to Know for Sure, a CBT-based guide to overcoming compulsive checking and reassurance seeking. Welcome to the show, Sally. Thank you very much for having me. Right. It's good to have you here. Um, and as I always like to get uh, with therapists, I like to understand their kind of therapy story. So why they got into being a therapist and ultimately why they got into treating OCD and anxiety. Well, um, let's see. That's a long story. Um, I um, did my postdoctoral fellowship. I was the first one at uh, Shepherd Pratt Hospital in Baltimore. And um, at the time, uh, the hospital was almost exclusively psychoanalytically oriented, Mm -hmm. and I came from a very eclectic, um, behavioral, cognitive, integrationist kind of background. So um, I was basically the hired heretic for several years. And then when there was somebody who had stumbled into the work of Claire Weeks, um, one of our um, disaffected psychoanalysts, um, he sought me out um, because he was trying to figure out what that was all about. And in the course of my relationship with him, his name was Doug Headland, I ended up exploring uh, anxiety disorders before there was such a thing. So in 1978, we started the Agrophobia Clinic at Shepherd Pratt. And the rest is history. I ended up uh, getting involved with the Anxiety Disorders Association and through them um, continued to specialize in anxiety. And then that turned also into OCD, of course. So there's my story. And it all starts really with the work of Claire Weeks, who seems mostly forgotten, but uh, she basically came up with uh, ACT um, about five decades ahead of uh, Steve Hayes. So she was an Australian family practitioner. Yeah, no, that's uh, good to hear. And yeah, her name doesn't get dropped that much, uh, unfortunately. Um, But yeah, it definitely comes up for me in in conversations. Yeah, well, a new uh, biography of her is coming out shortly by Judith Hoare. That will be available very soon. Cool, fantastic. Um, Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, And... You know, most of my questions today are around your new book, uh, Needing to Know for Sure, which is about uh, compulsive checking and reassurance seeking. Um, and this is, as I'm sure every listener is uh, aware of, is a, is a big compulsion for many people with OCD. Um, mm-hmm. So, but just to give clarification, what is compulsive reassurance seeking? Well, we're using it in a, in a, a rather broad way. Um, uh, what we're particularly interested in is um, not the most obvious kind of reassurance seeking, which is just asking people for reassurance, but all the subtle ways in which people seek uh, ways to, uh, to reduce their doubts and to 
get rid of a feeling of uncertainty. And so what we're particularly interested in are the more subtle forms of reassurance seeking, which, which can be both uh, behavioral and, uh, and also cognitive. Um, it, it, it ranges from um, sort of a constant checking of emails and uh, mm. empty reassurance seeking, like asking someone who doesn't really know anything, uh, sort of, don't you think everything is going to be okay, or... I look, I look all right, right, or, you know, this cough couldn't possibly be cancer, right? That sort of, sort of um, reassurance seeking, just a sort of asking for kindness that somebody tell you that the future is going to be all right, and actually they don't know anything more than you do. But also the more subtle things like watching the person who's giving you your mammogram very carefully in the tape in there to see if there's any possible signs of discomfort that they're seeing something that that uh, you know that they're not allowed to reveal mm-hmm. or the people who are lying in bed at night sort of script planning you know if I'm going to have something to say if the conversation turns this way or that way and have an entire script written for every possibility or escape planning or there's a lot of sort of rational self-talk, which is actually reassurance compulsion. People call it coping, but actually it's serving exactly the same function as any other compulsion, as a negative reinforcer, so that people are saying to themselves things like, well, what are the chances that that will happen? Or I'd never heard anyone right, right? Or trying to think positive instead of negative or things like that, telling themselves stuff repeatedly to try to counteract some worry thought or obsessive intrusion or intrusive thought that's caused some anxiety or doubts or discomfort. So that is what we're particularly interested. Yes, we're also interested in checking compulsions like the stove and the window and the door locks and, you know, what if I ran over someone in the car? Um, but those are m- more obviously talked about, and most most times you hear anything about OCD, you're going to hear about that kind of checking. But the more the more subtle and covert kind of checking, um, you don't hear much about. So that's why we wrote the book. You know, when somebody says "love you" with a question mark at the end of a conversation, for some people that's a check to make sure the other person says "love you back." Mm-hmm. You know, and it, it's the function of a lot of, of talking and self-talking that, um, that actually serves as compulsion. Things like over-apologizing and over-explaining and um, mental checking, things like that that you don't hear so much about. And we wanted to reach those people. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And with this type of compulsion... Um, Do you see it more with particular obsessions and worries or does it kind of just go across every worry and obsession? Well, I think it goes across the board because uh, not so much with sort of the uh, like the tick like uh, Mm. things like trichotillomania, things that don't have anxiety inducing thoughts, but anything which raises uh, doubts or uncertainty, um, the where the the function of the compulsion is to try to reduce doubts and uncertainty and the distress over that, um, whether it's fear over doubts or shame over doubts or um, disgust over uh, over doubts, all of these things tend towards people having ways of trying to reduce the, that experience. And so you'll get it with scrupulosity, you'll get it with, uh, you know, Tell me, you know, hypochondriasis. You'll get it with uh, all the existential doughty kinds of things. Um, people who are struggling with ROCD and HOCD, all of those things, they involve doubts. And uh, that's what we call the obsessive component is the what if part. And then pretty much anything which is then done either cognitively or behaviorally to try to reduce those doubts and is unproductive reassurance doesn't stick, then that can, people can fall into that reassurance compulsion trap and just keep going over and over and over. 
So, it can, I mean, it can look like very mundane sorts of things, like just, you know, trying to get the best deal on a TV where you you just can't stop checking the Internet for the very best deal and you just can't stop going over and over and over to try and make sure that you're getting the best deal. Mm. It could be something as mundane as that. So, yes, I think it's across the, almost across the board. Yeah, cool. No, thank you. Um, and you mentioned it there, and you talk about this in the book. You um, talk about reassurance seeking as being a trap. Um, yes. Why is this? Well, it's a self-perpetuating cycle, like all OCD. There's a doubt, which is the obsession, and then there's the the reassurance seeking to try to to eliminate the doubt, which then uh, reduces the doubt a little bit, which provides negative reinforcement, which then produces a reinforcement of the doubt. So you end up in a circular looping format that you can't get out and actually escalates. And so we call it a trap because as long as you stay within the the doubt, reduced doubt, doubt, reduced doubt cycle, you're going to stay trapped. And the idea is to to change your relationship to the discomfort you're feeling when you have doubts or change your ability to tolerate uncertainty, um, which is actually a feeling. Um, to be able to do that is the way out of the trap. Um, so you can't just keep going round and round trying to come up with a better and better way to reassure yourself. You have to step out of that loop into something significantly different. Mm. And, and that's what we're trying to, to do in the book is shift the person's relationship to their experience of uncertainty. Um, first of all, to understand that uncertainty isn't, in fact, danger. It's, a, it's distress. It's a feeling. It's not, a, it's not an indication of actual danger in the real world. And then to, to change the way they respond to it so they no longer seek reassurance or checking yeah no thank you for that and that was actually one of the things i pulled out of your book that i was going to ask you about so thank you for covering it um i think you actually put in the book uh, your brain makes uncertainty look dangerous which i really liked that um and how would you how would you work with a client to i was uh i guess there's many ways you can answer this but um make uncertainty or change their view of uncertainty, I guess, is what I'm asking. So that Well, I, I, yeah, I, I think the first thing is to actually explore uncertainty mm. um, because usually in OCD or in, in this kind of looping thinking, um, people have it only about some things and not about other things. Um, and they don't realize that they're actually accepting uncertainty in vast ranges of their life. Um, at one point, I think we say in the book, uh, when, when we say to somebody, um, meet me at noon for coffee at the corner of this and that, um, we don't say, provided I don't have a stroke or die in between or get hit by a car on my way there. I mean, we just kind of make assumptions all the time that things will be okay, even though if you actually look at virtually anything, you can't be certain about it. You can't be certain that something terrible isn't going to be happening. You can't be certain that when you go to sit down in a chair that all three legs are going to work. But in most of our lives, we just kind of accept all this uncertainty and carry on with that illusion, and it works fine. But then something gets sensitized around some issue. And that one thing becomes something that people have trouble accepting doubts about. And they treat those doubts as if they're signals or warnings or messages about something that can't really be known. Um, So what we want to do is try and get people to see that that certainty is actually a feeling. It's not a fact. Mm. And that it's a feeling that you can tolerate, even about very, very important things. Um, one, of, one, one thing we might do is a uh, demonstration I do all the time when I'm giving lectures about this, which is I, I say to people, think of someone you love. Um, now I want you to ask yourself, do you know for sure that they're not dead right now? 
And most people will, you know, have a little bit of a shuffle and think a bit. And some people will sort of work towards their cell phones to see if they might, you know, call them. But the fact is that that they don't know that everyone that they love or that this particular person is not dead right this minute because they could have died five minutes ago and nobody has called them yet. So what what happens is then I say, um, how are you doing? And most people are like, well, they're a little uncomfortable, but they're not totally freaked out. Um, that's a demonstration that it's not the content of the of the thought. It's the feeling that goes with the thought that then pushes the need for reassurance. Hmm. One of the things that we know about obsession is that it's not really the content of the obsession. It's the feeling that goes with it. The obsession arrives and it has this huge, what Marty Seif, my co-author, likes to call the whoosh, or I call it, I'd call it a jolt or a spike. It, when, it, when the doubt, the one that you're sensitized to arrives, it arrives with, with an emotion, a fearful emotion stuck to it. And it feels different from a regular thought. And when you have that kind of a whoosh of a thought with the adrenaline surge and the fear that comes with it, that's what sets off the need to make that thought go away or to make yourself feel more sure or to seek some reassurance or to do something, avoid or something, to get out of that feeling. And and so, so when we talk about um, dealing with uncertainty. We talk about first what is uncertainty. You do know how to deal with it. It's just the sensitized things that trick you into thinking that the content is actually important instead of the fact that the whoosh came with it. Does that make any sense? It does, yeah. I, I completely agree. I always say if you remove the emotion from OCD, the, the OCD would no longer be troubling for most people. Um, it's, right. It's, 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 it's not just the thoughts. It's not the thoughts themselves. It's the emotion, yeah. it's how the thoughts feel and how they act. It's not the actual content of the thoughts, and that's that's a new idea for most people because mm. they want they want is this thought true? Is it false? Do I need to do so? How likely is it? They they get all entangled with the content of the thought. And what we're trying to do is say, no, that's a thought with a feeling stuck to it. And now, if you don't want to go round and round, you got to you got to change your relationship with it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and w- what were some ways you would get people to start to reduce this type of compulsion and eventually stop it? Um, well, um, first they need to understand what's going on, and this our books are written particularly for people who who don't necessarily even know they have OCD to start with because um, the books uh, deliberately don't have the word OCD in the title because a lot of times if people have intrusive thoughts or they have reassurance seeking, they, they think that's their problem and they don't know to go look in the OCD section of the bookstore. Mm. So, so the, we deliberately talk about reassurance seeking because people think I'm weak, I'm indecisive, I need a lot of reassurance, I'm kind of a wimpy person. They make it a personality attribute. So what we're trying to do is reach those people. So first we have to have an education um, for many people about there's some good news here. You don't have a personality flaw. You have OCD. It's very treatable. We know what to do with it. It's good news. It's not bad news. It's a very, we, call, we tend to call it OCD light, you know, like bud and bud light to make it seem sort of, you know, a sort of more subtle uh, uh, kind of OCD, but it's definitely OCD and we know what to do with it. So then we, we start with a basic education about what is an obsession, what is a compulsion, how do they relate to each other, what's going on here, what's happening in the brain, and so on, to get them to the place where they're willing to do what, what we call, in this book we're calling it therapeutic surrender which is basically stopping the struggle with the input from the OCD and changing how you deal with it. And then we give some steps about how do you reach 
therapeutic surrender, which is not the same thing as I give up. I have to suffer the, for the rest of my life. It's surrender the struggle. Stop struggling mm-hmm. against it because it's just as smart as you are, and it'll always win. Mm-hmm. So we, we, have a, we have something we call DEAF, D-E-A-F. So you're deaf to the cries of the OCD. Mm-hmm. And it's just just an acronym to help people remember. Um, D is for distinguish, which means distinguish your your trap from your from a real emergency. In other words, it feels urgent, but are you entering the OCD trap? Can you can you feel it? Can you see? Can you get it labeled right? It's a labeling step. And then embrace uncertainty and discomfort, which is the attitude shift of not get this away from me, but I'm going to encircle it. I'm going to include it in my experience. Avoid reassurance, which is something you can only do when you've figured out what is it you are doing for reassurance, which isn't always obvious. Mm. And then float, which is actually a term from Claire Weeks. Um, Float and let time pass, which is basically float is the opposite of paradoxical effort it's the opposite of trying it's very hard to explain don't work so hard or do less or be passive but it's 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 an image of like a cork floating on the water whatever the water does the cork just bounces around it's a it's about disentangling and not trying just kind of let things be there and let time pass and those four steps constitute surrender and uh, and then we give a million examples of that. Yeah. Cool. No, thank you for explaining that. Um, and then uh, one thing I really liked is, I think it actually might be the name of a chapter in the book, which is living in a world of maybe and good enough. Um, uh-huh. So my question was going to be, what does it mean to live in a world of maybe and good enough? Well, we're talking about uh, living a flexible life uh, in which you can take chances. Mm. Um, you know, one of the one of the uh, the things that happens with uh, falling into a reassurance trap or or just having OCD is that you're scrambling so hard to feel safe that all risks seem unreasonable. Anything that you could make a mistake seems like you shouldn't try. And when you get to the place where risk is something you can embrace and uncertainty is something you can acknowledge, then you're freed up to try new stuff, to possibly make mistakes, to um, trust yourself more. Um, so it's it's a, it's a really about freedom. Um, and... Um, and it, it relieves you from that sort of all or nothing black or white kind of thinking that tends to come along with OCD. Um, you can try stuff. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, living flexibly, I guess, is the goal. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, and then uh, my next question was, how can families support people with OCD who are trying to break reassurance-seeking cycles? Uh, this is, you know, this is so important because so much of the reassurance seeking takes place in the family context. Mm. And, of course, OCD is highly heritable and it runs in families. So you've got parents and kids and siblings, all of whom all have some form of OCD and the grandparents. So it can it can be intergenerational and it can certainly be the case that people who don't want family members to suffer um, offer reassurance as uh, an immediate um, relieving thing to do for someone who's suffering. So families are pretty much always, or or significant others, are pulled into this trap with you. Um, so we, in the book, actually, and in the other book, too, the it's Intrusive Thoughts book and this book, we illustrate uh, interactions um, both internally and externally, by using what we call the three voices of the mind. There's a um, there are three characters that have um, dialogues in the books that kind of illustrate typical ways that people interact with each other. One of the what, there are three of them. One of them is called worried voice. 
um, which is basically obsession. Um, it's the what if -er, it's the worrier, it's the yes butter, it's the it, it, very creative, imaginative, can come up with all the bad things that could possibly happen in an instant. And the worried voice is sort of constantly present, offering, you know, offering obsessive content. And the second voice, uh, which is often the family, is, is false comfort. Um, which is either internal or external, um, which is the voice of compulsion. Um, it's the voice of, uh, here's something I can tell you that might make you feel better immediately. So it's a reassurer. It's a uh, suggestion for avoidance. It's um, constantly offering ways to uh, try to reduce uncertainty. And the two of them, worried voice and false comfort, oh, obsession and compulsion, basically, interact with each other, constantly escalating, because whatever false comfort comes up with in just a few minutes, that raises another question for worried voice, and then worried voice has, you know, something else to what if about. So this circular process happens in families. Um, and the, the third voice, let me get back to families in just a minute, the third voice is uh, wise mind, which is obviously a term borrowed from um, Eastern philosophy and meditation. And wise mind is the part of the mind that is going to teach how to step back and be mindful and not enter the reassurance trap, not go around looping, be able to observe that's a thought and we're not going to respond to it. So it's mindful, non-judgmental, kind of non-urgent um, voice which we all have and we have to learn how to access more easily. In family accommodation, pretty much you've got worried voice as the person with the OCD and false comfort as everybody else until they really understand what's going on. So family members are constantly offering ways to make the person feel better, which really constitute reassurance. Um, how you do this is we like to bring family into the session and to have the person who has OCD try to explain to their partner, their parent, their, uh, their child, their sibling, whatever, you know, that what's going on and why they are needing to not um, be accommodated by by that person acting like false comfort. And they, they have to kind of betray themselves and offer suggestions as to how the person might kindly um, not respond with reassurance. Um, it's What often will happen is that family members will just start yelling, that's your OCD, and it's it's very hostile and it's, it, it's, it's very unpleasant. So we want it to be, we want the person with OCD to be able to say, you know, put your arm around me and say, I know this is very hard, but I really can't act like false comfort or I really can't offer you reassurance. Remember, you asked me not to. Mm -hmm. And we even have a little script in the book of how a person can ask their family members that includes things like, and if I pull out the big ones, like, if you love me, you'll just tell me this one time, you know, or all the, the ways that people try to you know, get reassurance anyway, you know, to put that in the script as well and to try to practice that as much as possible. It's not the easiest thing in the world, and a person has to be quite ready to, to, um, to ask for this kind of help. And they, need to, they need to understand it very well, and they need to understand that it's not going to be easy for anybody. Yeah. No, thank you. That was really useful. Um... Okay, and what might be some of the obstacles that people face in their recovery when they're starting to reduce and stop these compulsions? Um, well, you know, there are a lot of obstacles. Mm. What, some of them are just the, the usual obstacles of being busy and distracted by your life or in some cases having a chaotic life or real-life stuff that has to be dealt with so that practice becomes something that goes on the back burner all the time. Cause it's so much easier just to get a little bit of reassur reassurance instead yes. of actually practice. But I think probably the most um, most difficult impediment is 
um, is is sort of anxiety sensitivity, the fear that you won't be able to bear it, that you that you you can't tolerate uncertainty. It's not worth it. You can't do it. You're going to fall apart. You're going to it you, that it's not going to work. It's all the doubts about the therapy itself. You know, who made you the person who knows how to do this? It might work for other people. It won't work for me. I mean, the doubts that happen about whatever it is that they're having doubts about are not exclusive to that. Then there's the meta doubts, you know, the doubts about the entire process. And so that has to be addressed. And sometimes over and over again, people do have to realize they, they, they can and are tolerating distress and that they can do it. So there's a lot of motivational interviewing that may, might be required. You know, what are you paying for this to, to get that piece of reassurance, what do you pay? Mm-hmm. And to kind of zoom out a little larger and take a look at that. Um, but there's also, you know, co-occurring conditions. I think if somebody has this problem and they're also severely depressed, um, you really got to treat the depression first because it takes a lot of motivation to do this. It takes a certain amount of trust. Um, and it also, in some ways, it takes a certain sense of humor to see how absurd and even funny your own worried voice can be. And um, if you have no sense of humor at all, and if you're seriously depressed, trying to put in this effort and change your attitude, it's just often prohibitively difficult. So mm-hmm. depression would be something that would be a big impediment. Um, so would um, serious substance abuse, which will interfere with recovery every time. Mm-hmm. So that would be another thing you'd want to take a look at first. Cool. No, thank you for that. Um, and a slightly more generic question now, which is just words of hope for those with OCD. Words of hope. Yeah. Well, as I said earlier, the good news is you have OCD. Uh, a great many people know they have OCD and they think they know what OCD is, but they really don't. Um, and you can even go to a therapist who claims to know uh, how to treat OCD and they really don't. And if you're not getting anywhere in therapy or you're not getting anywhere in, in your own self-treatment um, using you know, videos and um, and uh, and OCD stories and um, reading and so on. If you're not getting anywhere, it's likely that you've missed some kind of subtle something that just needs a slight t- turnaround. A, somebody who really does know OCD and does know how to treat OCD is going to be able to find that. It's a little subtle key. It's a little shift in attitude. It's something that's maintaining your symptoms that you haven't yet understood. Once we find that, the whole thing can turn around and you can get better. I, I, it's so important that people get um, the the best possible assessment of their OCD that they can get um, and an understanding of it that's more than the superficial I have OCD. Um, uh, so that's one piece of hope um, because those it exists. People who really do know how to treat this stuff and it really can make a, a huge difference in your life. And we're actually, we're getting flooded with, with, um, calls and letters from people who got one subtle thing out of the book, the last book or, or, or something that we said that, that shifted the, the basic attitude towards the experience of OCD rather than trying to fight with the OCD or fix it or, or apply a technique. It's a different thing. It's a shift in your relationship with it. And that that is not so easy to get, but once you get it, it just opens the world up. Mm-hmm. So that's one piece of hope. Um, is, and, and I hope that that comes across um, um, it, as an inspiration. Yeah, it does to me, yeah. Um, I agree. Sometimes, yeah, you've, you've just got to understand it in a particular way or in your way and 
yeah, I can definitely think about it in my own life and think about one particular thing that kind of stood out for me that kind of just changed my attitude towards it all. Um, it was obviously many factors which helped, but there was one kind of mind shift in the way I was looking at my it, struggle. Exactly. And and I think that people can get very demoralized if they're if they're busy sort of just pushing on with great deal of effort and energy and um and and they're pushing on the wrong thing and it's it's not there's it's not for lack of trying mm-hmm. it's not your fault if you're not getting better yet there's some little shift in there that that can make a, a huge difference and and i've heard that story so often actually well i just got an an email from somebody who said that she this is in reference to the intrusive thoughts book, she said she read the book and it was very it was helpful and she started working on things and then she started to feel a lot better and then she went back to read it again and she said the first time I read the dialogues I was working so hard I missed the fact that they're actually funny mm. and I thought you got it <laughs> you you got it those are just thoughts they're not. They're not life and death, intense, horrible things that they feel like. Um, they're actually, once you step back and take a look, you can see it completely differently. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like that. Thank you for sharing. Um, and then a couple very different for, uh, not thoughts, uh, questions now. Uh, the first one is, if you could pick up the phone and call your 20-year-old self, what would you tell her? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> if I could pick up the phone and tell my 20-year-old self, what would I tell her? I, hmm. <laughs> I would tell her, go ahead and marry that guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I actually do not have OCD or an anxiety disorder. Mm. I, I stumbled into this um, because of because of where I was working and and my background and training. So I don't have advice for myself about my OCD, although I can guess that people who have recovered from their OCD and, like you, have made that attitudinal shift, there would be such an effort to try to explain that to your Mm -hmm. 20-year-old self. Um, I think the... I think... uh, don't take everything so seriously would be a would be a general kind of comment I would make to myself. Yeah. Yeah, no, good good words. Um and then next one is you've got a billboard. Uh what do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see? Um hmm. It's not the symptoms, it's your relationship with them. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Um, did you want to explain that or do you want to leave it as it is? I'll just leave it. Cool. Well, here's another one. Acceptance, not control. Hmm. Okay, cool. You are bigger than your thoughts. There's, I, would, I think I'd like to have about 50 billboards, <laughs> may I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what the impulse to write a book comes from. Yeah, yeah, lots to say. No, that's good. Um, cool. No, thank you for those. And then, is there anything else on this topic, or anything else that you wanted to share that I haven't asked you today? Hmm, let me think about that. Um, just that my long-term relationship with my co-author, Dr. Marty Seif. He and I have um, done all our work together, uh, all our writing work together, although we work and live in different cities. Um, Dr. Seif is, uh, has a, a private practice in Greenwich, Connecticut, and in New York. And he is one of the original founders of the ADAA. And I'm grateful to him for the constant back and forth that the both of us have. Um, uh, and uh, most of the concepts we've come up with, neither one of us can attribute them to either one of us because they just develop organically. Um, oh, I know something I'd like to talk about that yeah. I haven't talked about. Go for it. 
we introduced a concept in an article in the networker about four or five years ago, which is basically when therapists become false comfort. It was an article written for general therapists about OCD, and it was, we introduced the concept of co-compulsing. And co-compulsing is when you supply your patient with subtle cognitive compulsions to replace behavioral compulsions, or when you apply unproductive reassurance, or when you act like false comfort, where you suggest coping skills, also a term I very much don't like, um, which are actually ways of providing either subtle reassurance compulsions or little avoidance behaviors or little escape planning things or ways of getting through or past or white-knuckling your way through anxiety and that they will work in the moment and patients will very often leave your office with a sense of I have a technique or I have a skill or I have some way to combat my anxiety but they come back the next week or the week after and they're in just as rough shape. And I think that sort of that way of doing therapy can just become an endless trap. And we call that therapist co-compulsing. It's very subtle because it can look like, you know, you know, reframing or very insightful, interesting conversation and everybody goes, aha, and they all feel better. But actually what you've done is you've just provided some compulsive, compulsive reassurance of some kind mm-hmm. and or some other coping, which is really a negative reinforcer and doesn't help at all in the long run. So that, you know, our, our initial uh, wish was to reach general therapists to get them to just raise their level of suspicion that the anxiety they were dealing with was actually OCD and that this kind of treatment um, was not, was going to be endless um, Mm -hmm. and uh, not effective. And so that's, that's how we started with this whole journey. So what we, we didn't call it false comfort back then because we never thought of false comfort back then, but that's really what it was. Mm. And that's that. That's been our mission. Okay. No. Thank you for sharing that. And hopefully, uh, we we do have therapists that listen to this. Most of them are OCD therapists, though. But for those that maybe aren't, hopefully that was yeah useful to them too. Um, cool. No. Look, Sally. Thank you so much for giving me your time. I've I've learned lots on this and uh, found it very interesting. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm happy to have this conversation. And um, if people are listening and they want to be in touch with me, do you have a way of connecting them to me? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, in the show notes on my website, I'll put a link to your website and they can go through that. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah, that and would be great. And a link to the books and stuff. Thank you very much. No, my pleasure. So there you have it. Thank you to Dr. Sally Winston for her time and thank you to you guys for listening. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It's not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.